True story. My friend Edna Nahon Flavel and I joined oh, yes. Waikato University because we wanted to be you. No. That's true. We enrolled to do educational psychology degrees. Oh. Yeah. And then I failed in the maths. <laughs> so, the statistics. Yeah. So I ended up going to court with Dan Mihaka, saw how badly he was treated, so then I enrolled to be a lawyer. Oh, oh. As a lawyer instead. Yeah. Oh. But you a know, you're certainly a uh, hero. <laughs> how many times have you been arrested? Okay, so I've had 21 arrests and 21 suspensions. Hmm. They tell me it's the most, I'm the most suspended public servant in the history of the public servant. You went to Cuba. What happened there? What we did was we met people there who were really seriously oppressed, like the Palestinians. And we met um, the survivors of a group of Palestinian women who were hijackers and their commander, who was a colonel. She was the last hijacker still alive. And we went to stay with her in Fidel's palace and Rebecca Evans uh, formed a great friendship with her and really through her and meeting with the, the other liberation fighters, we came to realise that actually we had been mucking about. In terms of strategies, mobilisation and tactics, what did you learn in Cuba? We, we looked at the Springbok tour coming up and the three of us, Josie Keelan, Rebecca Evans and myself, made a conscious decision that we would assume the leadership of that movement bring Māori Dim in and bring the eyes of the Pākehā movement of Liberal New Zealand onto our struggle, bring it home. And we did. Was it you that issued the order to break the fence down at the Waikato game in 81? What happened was I had the mic. Someone else was meant to do it, but they were too busy doing something else and they missed the point. And I realised, if we do not go here, we're going to miss the point. So. I'm looking, you know, as you do, you always look, who's, who's going to do this? Then you think, well, I've got the megaphone, you know, and 10,000 others don't. So I went like this, bring the fence down. <laughs> so, and everyone, all the bolt cutters, the front line went like this, and all the bolt cutters, they all ran up and chopped. And I was behind, you know, directing people across, <laughs> across the thing, you know. I was a child psychologist at this stage. It was sort of not not part of the plan. Was that a new strategy that you employed in the 71 protest? Look, we um, actually walked around the outside of the, of the um, field where the serum was taking place, very dignified, you know, with our kōrawai all in black, with Hana looking magnificent in her, you know, kōrawai as she did. And then she just broke rank. I mean, one woman just broke rank and changed the next three decades. She ran onto that field and in doing so, she exposed all of us who didn't run into the field. And I was thinking to myself, I'll never not run onto the field again. Did you get much kickback from the older generation? Total, total, they were ashamed of us. You wrote the book on Māori sovereignty and then you went into parliament, into the belly of the beast. Now, how does that work? I got asked if I would stand and Eddie Tunner and I, liked ACT because of its, of its policy of the funding following the child. That was the one thing we liked, where um, Labour had stopped the further growth of Kura Kaupapa at 60 and really stymied our movement. And they had put all of the rules of um, the early childhood sector onto kohanga and also stymied the movement. So we went from 800 to 500, just crashed. And the movement towards... Um, primary schools crashed. And so we thought by joining ACT, where the funding follows the child, you don't need anything else than a group of 20, 50, 100 parents to say yes, then you could get the language. Being politically naive and naive about economics, I didn't realise at the time that this was a neoliberal agenda that was actually going to benefit the 1% at the expense of the 99%. And once I realised that, I determined to stay in Parliament and fight with, with, from within and to raise my concerns at every caucus, which, you know, to the extent that I was able to, I did. Mm. So I don't resolve from going in. I think what was important is that you should go in wherever. Greens, go in. Any church you decide to go in. Um, but ACT was just one step too far. And, you know, I am proud of the fact that because of the... Um, the issues that erupted around me that led to me being expelled from Parliament, I actually helped bring down ACT 
And that, to me, is a big achievement. What was the big lesson you learnt after being in Parliament? Did it change your thinking or did it reinforce what you already knew? It, it, what it did was it really brought home to me um, the fact that it was designed Pai Pākehā as an as a, as a instrument of imperial power and that its sole purpose was colonisation. There's been some criticism that the protests are all a little bit too nice. How do you think we're going now? I'm proud of them myself. You know, I think that um, they are who they are. They are super intelligent. They are hugely well briefed. Um, they are, you know, precisely articulate. Um, you know, they command both languages and, and they're beautiful. And so they are just being who they are, and that's all they have to be. They don't have to be like me and Tame, you know, and, um, you know, Sid, your uncle, and, and the rest of us. We just did what we did with what we had. But I think that they are just, you know, they're like iPhone 12. <laughs> Where did you draw the line in terms of protest? Was there a line that you yourself would not cross? We would never do anything to harm anyone personally, so. We've also got good manners, so, you know, you treat police and others with respect. But that doesn't mean to say that I didn't break the law at times, you know. When you look at the result of it was that we transformed a nation. We transformed a nation. And the transformation was that we transformed Māoridom. That's who we transformed, not Pākehā. They just carried on. Eva wasn't hooked into a wider Pākehā movement. She rung me and said, look, I need some of you to come down. I need 12 people to get arrested on the day. She's going to you know, have a dawn ceremony to reopen Mere Te Kākara, their marae, on the green, on the golf course. And um, the police would come in and at 12 o'clock, the old people would finish their ceremonies and then we young people from Auckland would move on and then we'd get arrested. That was the deal. And it, so it was like working the young people who, not that we weren't fearless, we were very afraid, but it was better than us than, you know, our old people do it. So working together, we could bring, um, get the result, which is what we got, which is that golf course has been returned. The land has gone back to those people. I mean, it, it was a stunning victory that was led by um, Eva Rickard, where the old and the young worked together. We had the same thing happen in the Springbok tour, where um, Pekka and I went to visit the gangs, Black Power, Mongol Mob, and asked them to be our front line in our groups, and they did. Activism has been changed now with the advent of social media. How has that transformed the political landscape? Extinction Rebellion is an international phenomenon, and those are social media. You know, even the, um, the Arab Spring that toppled governments was a phenomenon. So we're rolling with the times, and, you know, it, it's a good thing. What's, where it's not a good thing is where many people come to rely on it as reality. It's not real until you turn it off and march out that door. That's where you, participation is where the body goes, not just the eyeballs. That's the challenge. When you look at activism, what is the spectrum in terms of the protest landscape? Had Sir Graham Latimer not forged his partnership with Jim Bolger, had the Māori Council not been there to translate our cries and our energy and activism into policy points and into programmes inside government, we wouldn't be where we are today. Is there anything now that you would look back and do differently? Something that you yes. might... Yes. Just about every single thing I did and was involved in. Um, I look back and think, my goodness, we could have done it better. Um, but the movement doesn't lend itself to reflection and to self-criticism. What is your advice for today's activists? Pick the issue that means most to your heart and to our people, that you judge is going to make the biggest difference for you as an individual. And then just do that. Once you make the decision, Everything else is easy because people will feel it. They will feel your wairua. You will communicate that not only to Māoridom, but you will communicate it to Pākehā and they will see 
in your body stance and the way you carry yourself, they will see that you have clicked onto another plane, into that beam of light that links your ancestors from the past into the future.